Welcome to our video on daylighting, coordinating structure, daylighting apertures, and ductwork in multi-story buildings. So the previous video dealt mainly with roofing systems, which would apply to single-story buildings or the top floor of multi-story buildings. At this point, though, we want to focus on those floors that inherently need to be serviced by light admitted through the walls. At this point, it's probably worth noting that many people shy away from daylighting systems that admit light through the roof for reasons of possible water leakage and cost of detailing and so forth. Uh, but it should be said that bringing light in through the roof generally is the most satisfactory way of doing things. You can get uh, light in, in entering the space in more than one direction. Um, the apertures can be spaced closely enough that you get very uniform light. And you also have broad latitude in terms of orienting the glazing in the roof. Whereas the facades of your building may be dictated in their orientation by site constraints and other issues. So generally speaking, if you've got the opportunity to bring light in through the roof, that's a grand way to do it and, and from a light quality and an energy point of view, the best way to do it. However, there are many floors in buildings that have to be serviced in some other way. And so that's what we're going to focus on in this particular um, video. So here we show a north-facing uh, space. In this case, the height of the aperture has been set based just on what's necessary to provide a decent view. And um, typically the light, the glazing in the wall is not going very high and the light penetration is not very deep. We can run the glazing all the way up to the roof um, or as high as it can go. And the higher it goes, the deeper the penetration of the light. So if you're interested in just view, this is the appropriate response from an energy and light quality point of view. If you're interested in both view and daylighting, then you'd like to run the glass up as high as possible. So we'll talk about various ways of getting the glass up further. In the process of increasing the height of the glass, we need to think about some of the other architectural and technical implications. For example, if we want to go from glazing like this height, which illuminates in a certain depth here on this task surface, if we want to run the glass up higher, we have a choice. We can either increase the floor to floor dimension of the building which has huge consequences in terms of the cost of increased area in the building envelope, but also raising the building much higher, which means it's more vulnerable to the effects of wind and the lateral forces of seismic events. So from an economic point of view, we'd like to figure out a way to raise the height of the glass, like so, without raising the floor-to-floor -floor dimension of the building. So here we have a certain floor-to-floor -floor dimension. Here we have the same floor-to-floor -floor dimension, but we have a higher ceiling. What that says is this interstitial volume, or sometimes called the floor sandwich, has to go from something fairly deep to something fairly shallow. And that's a crucial design challenge that you can't turn your back on if you're going to try and do this daylighting proposition in a serious way. So, we, it's worthwhile to take a little pause here for philosophical purposes. Um, with the advent of electric lighting, it became possible to get light deep in the core of the building without going to a lot of trouble to put high windows in the walls. At that point in history, building designers who were under siege already to produce higher and higher quality of life in terms of thermal control and lighting control decided that rather than lower the floor-to-floor -floor dimension of the building, they would lower the ceilings and create a larger interstitial volume. And their man method of managing that volume goes something like this. When the design team meets, 
they say, okay, we think we can deal with such and such a column grid, and therefore the spans are X number of feet, and they look at the structural engineer and they'll say, how deep does the deepest part of your structure have to be? And the structural engineer will answer, and from that moment on, this vertical dimension is pretty much owned by the structural engineer. Then they look at the HVAC engineer, and they say, what vertical dimension do you need for your deepest duct? And the, ver the mechanical engineer will answer a certain vertical dimension. And from that moment on, this volume belongs to the mechanical engineer. And then there's a volume for the electrical engineer, which has to account for, and this is not even drawn quite right, we're showing a fixture. This fixture often has to be pushed up in order to move it around to some other cell here. So there really needs to be even more of a little gap here to allow the maneuvering of these electric fixtures. So we have a certain depth of the fixture, a certain volume that's necessary for maneuvering the fixture, and then of course we have the hung ceiling down here. So all this adds together to be the sandwich panel, which is, or the sandwich volume, which in many buildings turns out to be on the order of five to six feet. This is what I call uh, volume allocation or systems allocation rather than systems coordination. This does keep life a lot simpler in terms of avoiding clashes and allowing people to deal with their particular problem, design problem, without a lot of coordination. So the HVAC engineer who knows he can rely or she can rely on this whole volume can proceed with that design process to a large degree independent of the mechanical engineer and vice versa. So <clears throat> now this large volume has come to be the accepted domain of all these design people and now we're going to have to ask them to work more closely together and coordinate more and this is pretty challenging to get them to do sometimes because fees are not very high and adding complications to the design process is generally not the first choice of any of the members of the design team. But every once in a while you can get a team of people that are eager to do something like this. So I'm going to talk about a particular project uh, called the Wildlife Conservation Commission Headquarters on Centennial Campus at North Carolina State University on which I did the systems integration and the structural design and a substantial part of the daylighting design. Uh, but much of the daylighting design was done by Jensen Hu, who got his PhD, um, and the research associated with this building was a key part of his PhD in design from North Carolina State University. So we start with a sort of basic common steel system with columns. Um, the deep members are girders, the shallower members are joists. Joists are shallower because they're less heavily loaded because they're responsible for less of the floor area. But they also, in steel, can be much shallower because if you put shear studs on the top of them, that allows them to act in composite action with the floor slab, the concrete slab. And then the, the depth of the concrete slab becomes effectively part of the depth of the joist. And in fact, in the wildlife building, the dimensions on, on the columns, the spacing on the columns was about 30 feet, uh, both this way and that way. So the depth of the building in this direction was 60 feet, and it was much, much longer in that direction. Um, <clears throat> now the philosophy in this is the following. If this wall is the south wall, and that wall is the north wall, those are our two primary daylighting sources, and we try not to make the building too wide in this direction. Our philosophy being that if we design this aperture system in the south wall properly, it can illuminate about 15 feet deep into the space, essentially 100% of the time during daylight hours. And then it can illuminate another 15 feet uh, about halfway, in other words, half the light that's required. And the same is true on the north side. Uh, essentially 100% effectiveness for 15 feet in from the wall and then 
roughly 50% 50, 50 effectiveness from there on. It's actually gradually varying and the electric lighting system has to be designed in its layout and its controls to supplement the daylight wherever the daylight's not adequate. So there are more systems issues and control issues associated with doing a daylit space of this sort. Now in this design we want to have as much openness and opportunity to let light in on the south side as possible and likewise on the north side. So the joist, which are the shallowest members, have been run in the east-west direction to allow the maximum vertical dimension for the glass on the south side and likewise the maximum vertical dimension for the glass on this north facade. And again I emphasize that these beams for the joists were only about 12 inches deep even though they're spanning 30 feet which is not within the list of spans and proportions and that's because there was a six inch deep concrete slab on the top which when acting in composite action with these wide flange joists increases their depth from effectively 12 inches to effectively 18 inches. So that allowed us to have the potential for a fairly shallow floor sandwich if we could figure out how to take advantage of that property that the joists are a lot shallower. By the way you'll notice we've got bracing in the east wall here and then bracing down the center line of the building in terms of resisting any forces in the east-west direction. We're basically putting the bracing where it's not interfering with anything. Uh, the east wall is the ideal place because we not only are not looking to that wall for our primary views or our primary daylighting, but because it's a perimeter wall people aren't going to be walking through it and therefore the bracing is not interfering with movement uh, on the occupied floor plane. If we had put that bracing along a line like this, it would be sloped interior bracing which uh, by inherently takes up a, a significant linear dimension of floor if you want to avoid having people whacking their heads on sloped bracing elements. So one version of the system that we came up with was the following. We wanted to deliver air through the floor or under an access floor and the idea was to bring the air gently up into the space um, and allow it to rise vertically and then take the air out through the ceiling. So for example for this floor right here or this story these ducts are delivering air into the plenum volume which is this access floor and you'll notice there's a duct running here which is primarily uh, filling this plenum volume for this zone. There's another duct here that's filling that plenum volume and then another duct that's filling the next plenum volume. You have to get air far enough along in a duct so that the thermal conditioning of that air doesn't degrade too much. So in essence we got a duct in this diagram. The duct is supplying a 30 foot by 30 foot patch of floor or the plenum underneath that floor. And by the way, we not only wanted this gentle rise of air from, we wanted it from the floor up to the ceiling for several reasons. One is that many of the contaminants in air come from human bodies and human bodies are like uh, thermal plumes. So the contaminants off of a human being tend to rise in a plume up to the ceiling. So if you take air out at the ceiling, you're tending to take out the most contaminated air and uh, having a gentle flow that starts at the floor and moves upward always assures some stratification of the contaminants which means that less air needs to be moved than if we blow air into a space and just basically keep mixing it all around so that the contaminants get swirled around into the space and uniformly distributed. The second thing, the second reason, by the way, that we wanted a continuous plenum volume in both the floor and the ceiling is that this was a building that required a lot of flexibility in the layout. It had big spaces and small spaces, and the client basically said, we want the ability to rearrange this, our interior partitions anytime we want to, and we want to know that we can get air to any new space that we create. 
So plenum volume has that power that basically if you're occupying floor area that means you have plenum volume available to you on the supply at the bottom and you have plenum volume available to you at the ceiling up above and there's no need to rearrange ductwork either under the floor or above the ceiling. So this was the scheme. We're delivering air under this uh, access floor. It comes up through the floor, comes through the ceiling, and then returns over the ceiling. Now, one of the challenges with this is that we originally put these deep girders running in the north-south direction because we did not want to interfere with daylight. But now we have airflow that's going in this direction under the floor, and we want to bring it back in the ceiling volume. But now these girders are now deep girders that become barriers to that airflow. And as a consequence, we have to have a really low ceiling, which is going diametrically against our design goal that we'd like to get the ceiling up as high as possible by reducing the interstitial volume. So now we've got this uh, plenum volume on the floor, the floor slab thickness, and the depth of the girders, and then we finally have an air volume for return and, and then a ceiling surface. So somehow we needed to solve this problem of the girders being in the way, and we looked at uh, boring holes in them, but that's kind of a problem because girders are considered really primary structure and they have to be extremely well fireproofed and you cannot have them be part of a return air system or any part of your air circulation system without fireproofing them really well. And what I finally decided was the following. I just decided to drop the girders down an extra 12 inches and run the joists over the top of them. And now the air actually returns over the top of the girders between the joists. This now means that the ceiling can be put up very close to the underside of these joists. The downside is that the, the girders do come down into the space. However, um, we have wide expanses of very high ceiling in between that compensate. And in fact, the girders don't even come down as low in the system as the ceiling would for a normal building and in between the girders the ceiling is very high. So this is a diagram of that space. The floor to ceiling dimension was 11 foot 2 inches and the overall floor to floor dimension was only 14 6. So the sandwich volume has been gotten down quite low. We incorporated light shelves, overhangs that are three feet out covering four foot high view windows and then there's four feet of daylight glazing above that and we're kind of showing in a very schematic way how light rays tend to come and bounce off of this light shelf and penetrate deeper into the space so we here we have the supply air coming in under the floor it goes up through the space goes through the ceiling and returns between the joists. So the overall depth of this floor sandwich from the finished ceiling surface to the top of the finished floor was three feet four inches which is on the order of two to two and a half feet less than is customary for a structure of this type. And that's what allowed us to have this 11 foot 2 inch high ceiling and this very high uh, daylight glazing up near the top of the wall. This is what the south side of that building looks like. So this is the three foot deep overhang over this bay with panoramic view glazing below and daylight glazing up above. This is what the north side looks like. Again, there's a four foot high view glazing and then a four foot high daylight glazing. There are no overhangs on the perimeter of this building because they're not necessary. In some of the spaces, we did incorporate light shelves on the inside to reduce the intensity of light near the window so people could set up their computers near the window and not have their computers overwhelmed. But also those light shelves help to make the light more uniform in those occupied spaces. 
So this is a south side uh, office and you'll notice we are beginning to get some beam sunlight towards the middle of winter uh, coming over the top of this light shelf. But we did studies that indicated that that light was not causing glare for any particular individual sitting in the space. This window does need to be protected by blinds at this particular time though whoever is occupying this building during the winter time doesn't seem to be bothered by the glare and seems to prefer to have the view. Uh, not everyone shares that notion though so there are blinds here and I might add by the way that we originally specified that those blinds would be mounted on the sill and would roll up from there because the problem with blinds like this is you really have to the first bit of beam sunlight comes in near the bottom so you have to roll the blinds all the way down in order to stop that beam sunlight. On the other hand if you have upwardly deployed blinds then you can just stop that sliver of beam sunlight and still have the view up above it. Um, it's very confusing though when you specify blinds like this. Um, these are called top-down blinds which the ones that come from the sill upward are called top-down which I don't think anyone understands that terminology so when you specify it and you go to your site and you discover that this is what people bought because that's what they actually thought you meant by that. So if you're concerned about doing this right you want to specify very carefully that the blinds are deployed from below and that they are the bulk of the blind mechanism is at the sill level and it goes upward from there. Here you see the light shelf which is taking this intense light up above and bouncing it up on the ceiling and this person as a consequence is able to work in a reasonably toned down comfortable visual environment where she can see her screen properly. This is a north side office and this is one of the offices where we did put light shelves in and <clears throat> from a design point of view I want to tell you that two huge issues are um, these light shelves make it more difficult to clean the windows up above but the light shelves also need to be cleaned. So this is a design issue that we need to deal with in this type of device. This is an example of what we might do with the east and west wall where people still want some view but they might uh, not want any daylight from there because of the glare issues and here the facade has been sort of sculpted to provide this brow which is an overhang for the glazing uh, and by the way this duct is the the return duct between for the air returning between these wide flange beams or joists it comes down into this uh, manifold duct which then eventually returns down to the basement the actual building didn't have that treatment because this wall was going to be the most visually prominent wall on all of Centennial campus. It's right at the entry to the campus and the architect felt that something more uh, exciting and interesting would be crucial for this west facade. So this louver system was built separated by several feet from the facade uh, as an attempt to diminish somewhat the effects of the western sun and these louvers by the way are designed so that people on these floors can look down between them at this uh, this uh, biodiversity exhibition that's been constructed uh, at the base of the building which is very crucial the occupants of this building are the wildlife commission so they're very interested in having people aware of wildlife and have an appreciation for it and so this Headquarters is not just a headquarters, but it's a, it's a teaching and environmental uh, and laboratory. And this wild space that's down below here is a crucial part of it. So they wanted to be able to have these views out of their windows towards that space. This is what this looks like in between. Those are those louvers. So we're not really using them too much for daylighting. They're mainly there to provide some sense of lightness at the same time protection from that unwanted west beam sunlight and you can't tell it with this picture but these louvers are actually set out about six feet 
from the facade so they do a pretty good job of protecting this view glazing also okay so in summary the system is the following there's a south wall and a north wall which are the primary sources of daylighting we're trying not to separate them by any more than 60 feet if we want to have effective daylighting in every space uh, there's a plenum volume under the floor that's being fed by ducts air comes up through the floor returns through the ceiling back between the joists which are set on top of the girders and by the way your structural engineer may raise his eyebrow a little bit when you put these beams on top of there but if your structural engineer is worth anything he or she will realize very quickly that that's actually a very logical way to do things it actually reduces the amount of detailing that needs to be done compared to what they normally do the one crucial thing your engineer needs to worry about is web buckling if these are very thin webs in these floor uh, joists there can be the potential for buckling of the web there and that detail needs to be designed accordingly okay we can do a structure like this in concrete also here's a precast version where a frame like this is manufactured and shipped to the site it has a good moment connection for resisting forces in the north-south direction um, these prefabricated or precast beams can then be set on top of there and post tensioning tendons can be run up through these so that they can be squeezed down against the frame down below and you'll notice that these beams are hollow everywhere except where they sit on top of a column because in essence the beam becomes the con continuous element of the column that goes on up through the structure some grout is appropriate at that location to uh, distribute the stresses because the beam will never come and bear perfectly on top of the concrete there will be little air gaps in some places and super high stress concentration elsewhere so a thin layer of some kind of high strength grout is crucial at all of these joints now this beam has created a moment connection to that column and to that column and that provides the resistance to force in the east-west direction the other thing you notice is this beam has been run continuous because what we don't want is the beam deflecting or changing angle a lot right over the support so a way of dealing with that is to add enough cantilever here so that the tendency to slope at this point is neutral for that beam and then we add in the next piece of beam which fits in here and we moment connect it at those joints so we now have a continuous beam that's moment connected to every one of these columns these original frames were moment connected to the vertical parts of the original frame so we have a rigid frame structure in both the north south and the east west directions and now this shows the structure with some double t's which would have to have an access floor on top of it and then there this shows the structure continuing on up with another floor and finally there's a version we're working on where it's not double t's but is a corrugated concrete material which is in the research and development stages but it has the potential of taking this three foot four inch uh, floor sandwich that we talked about in the wildlife building and reducing it by another foot which not only could give us great daylighting but actually could reduce the overall height of the building so that ends our video on coordinating the structure the daylighting apertures and the duct work in multi-story buildings now what i've presented is just a concept for how that can be done as designers over the course of your career you'll need to be thinking a lot about these things the key pitch that I want to make is that this is the domain of the architect. The engineers are not responsible for this. They are not responsible for systems integration. That is the domain of the architect. 
A structural engineer is a person focused on structures. He or she wants to do structures and he wants everything other, all other complications with which he or she is not familiar swept out of the way so that person can do his or her job uh, in the best possible way. You as the architect have to bring the team together and say, we're going to do daylighting. We don't want the height of the building to be absurdly high. We have to find a way to integrate these systems and I want us all to work together to do that. If the architect doesn't do that, it won't get done because it is not the job of those specialists. Bringing those specialists together in a cohesive team that gets a job done like this is the job of architects. Architects tend to want to work on floor planning because that's what they're good at, but this is every bit as important in terms of the efficiency and proper functioning and economic logic of the buildings you design.